Yesterday, SETI finally admitted that they have a protocol not to tell you when they find alien life. A long time ago, back in the 80s, we worked with the International Institute of Space Law to create a declaration of principles nice. for dealing with the detection of extraterrestrial technologies. And um, one of the important bullets in that protocol is uh, make sure you get it right. Uh, make sure that whatever you're going to announce is not some flaw in your detection system, that it really is what you're saying it is. Hey, and welcome back. So last year, I got into more trouble than I've ever been in my life by repeating what I was told by a European astronomer that we have found a technological signature, B. L C one. It's a very interesting year, and now you know why I hide in a cave. <laughs> so let me tell you about BLC one. BLC one stands for BL Breakthrough Listen C Candidate One. So C one. Let's analyze that. Candidate one came from a SETI survey called SETI at Home, but SETI at Home was nineteen nineties AI. It was you. <laughs> You, on your home computer, could analyse a tiny bit of a wideband signal recorded by radio telescopes to see if there was anything uh, repeating or narrowband or single point source. And it came up with 15, I hear, candidates. C1 to C15. At the time, I believe these were just C uh, candidates. And I think they might have been classified by their astronomical distance. So C1 being the closest, C15 being the furthest away. They're all uh, possible candidates in our galaxy. Not in the universe, but actually our uh, Milky Way galaxy, which is very large. So it makes sense that you start looking for more data from C1 than you do from C15. Along came Yuri Milner and his privately funded organization called Breakthrough Listen. Excellent. The bottom line for search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, done by anybody, is money. Because you need to either have your own or buy time on these large radio telescopes all over the world. And it costs a lot. So Yuri Milner poured money into finding extraterrestrial intelligence, a technological signature both from radio and from optical, anything. And I think they are going to be the ones who might announce it if it isn't going to be the Chinese. So Breakthrough Listen took the best candidates. Oh, already found by you. <laughs> C1 to C15. And C1 was the nearest. So they bought time on Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia to look at the candidate C1. And when they looked, it was still there. It's a single point source. So when you point Parkes away, it's not there. When you boop, you find it, it's there. When you go past it, it goes. So it's a single point source. That's very important. And not only is it a single point source, it's narrow band electromagnetic frequency. Now, EM frequencies, that's what we use for radio telecommunication. And it's um, emblematic of a piece of technology. Maybe. I mean, why would aliens use EM frequency? It works. It's good. It's useful for Wi-Fi. It's useful for radio. It's useful for television. It's also useful for data and even power transmission. So a signature using EM frequencies would be emblematic of a alien race who was technologically advanced in a similar window where we are currently, maybe for only for the last couple of hundred years since we've started using electricity. Jill Tarter makes this excellent point that if we find a technological signature from a race which is far more developed than us, that means that our technology that we feel might ultimately kill us, be the end of us, AI, 
consumes us as babies or whatever isn't going to happen. And in fact, a non-human intelligence might continue using EM frequencies for thousands of years. So it would be a very hopeful thing to find. Even if we don't know what they're saying, just finding a non-human intelligence that's still using similar technology to we are in our infancy um, would be very reassuring. So back to BLC1, Breakthrough List and Candidate 1. It's a single point source and it's narrowband electromagnetic frequency. So they wrote a report saying that it's interference. The possibility is that it's human. Well, um, okay. If it's human interference, where is the object, the human made object up in space that's a single point source? interference would be coming from somebody's mobile phone in Australia or a microwave oven all over the place. But no, it's coming from a single point source. And second, they said, well, the electromagnetic frequencies are emblematic of frequencies humans might use for telecommunication. They're not. What satellite, and that's what it would have to be, is one, at a single point, and two, using frequencies from the frequencies they found from this um, source. Uh, there aren't any. I suppose the signal could be distorted or multiplexed or moved into some EM frequency range, which we don't use. But the point that Breakthrough Listen made in their report was we can't confirm that we found a technological signature. I find that very strange because although that is true, you would think that they would say we found a candidate that shows signs that we're not alone in the universe. A possible technological signature. Okay, it might be wrong, but it's worth further investigation. So when I pressed principal investigator of Breakthrough Listen on that point, he absolutely poo-pooed that it was real. He's sticking to his original report saying it's probably human interference. But when I said, well, is it still of interest? He off the record said to me, we're still listening to it. So it is a candidate to this day. And then everything changed. I contacted somebody from Parks who actually did the radio telescope and he told me personally a third piece of evidence, a piece of evidence that wasn't, I believe, in the Breakthrough Listen original report. And that was single point source, yes, narrowband, yes, but Doppler shifted. That means that the source of the signal is orbiting, rotating. Well, that pretty well excludes human interference. A satellite, is it there? Nope. Frequency, is it frequencies that humans use? Nope. And is it rotating like an extraterrestrial planet? Nope. It's a very good candidate. Why aren't they admitting it? Right. So that led me down this enormous rabbit hole of trying to ask them, both SETI and Breakthrough Listen, um, why aren't you sharing with the science community and the public the fact that you found a possible candidate and you've no doubt found others that you're just keeping completely quiet about? Um, why are you doing that? Um, I'm off the Christmas card list of Breakthrough Listen, so they won't speak to me. So I contacted the press officer at SETI, and she doesn't speak to me either. And I also reached out to the person that you saw at the beginning of this video called Jill Tartar. Jill is fantastic. In fact, Jill Tartar and Neil deGrasse Tyson and me, Simon Holland, worked together on a series for PBS in Boston called Origins. I remember working with Jill, who's a fantastic woman, talking about spectral analysis and the very young Neil deGrasse Tyson, his first TV gig on Origins. And um, I'm sure they don't remember me, but 
I reminded Jill that we had worked together and I wanted to know Seti's position about candidates. Why Seti seemed reluctant to release publicly the names and positions of candidates that they found something which might be a good signature. But they're not doing that. And she didn't reply. We got the answer yesterday. Jill Tartar admitted that SETI have a policy not to share candidates, not to share publicly initial scientific information because they don't want to look foolish. Now, obviously, I don't care about looking foolish, and I think it's something that we need to share publicly. I was told by the organisation who actually parses or looks at the data for Breakthrough Listen in Europe that they have found many candidates and they are frustrated that Breakthrough Listen and or SETI aren't releasing that data. And I didn't understand it. Listen again to what Jill Tartar told Neil deGrasse Tyson and you will realise why you, as a member of the public, aren't being told the truth. A long time ago, back in the 80s, we worked with the International Institute of Space Law to create a declaration of principles nice. for dealing with the detection of extraterrestrial technologies. And... Um, one of the important bullets in that protocol is uh, make sure you get it right. Uh, make sure that whatever you're going to announce is not some flaw in your detection system, that it really is what you're saying it is. And that that's, uh, that's so important that now we actually suggests that the, the most valid way of searching is to search with at least two instruments widely separated on the surface of the earth um, so that there, the signals received by those two instruments will have a calculable Doppler shift between signals arriving here and signals arriving there. And that is a good signature to be looking for in addition to whatever's embedded in the uh, information content of the signal. That's the answer. They have found candidates of non-human intelligence, technological signatures, but they don't want to share it. The truth needs to be out there.